Let's get started. Our next speaker is um, Anuj Mubai, and uh, his affiliations are longer than his abstract. Okay, and uh, uh, he has a rich career, and I've asked him uh, to talk to us at more length than he did last year's conference about that, and that that journey that he will share with us is very. Uh, important. Each of us has a story. Each of us has a journeys. And I am quite confident that uh, I could ask any one of you to give a half an hour, at least talk about a journey and, and what influences and who influenced you anything from your mother to your Aunt Louise to a dean who fired you and then you had to leave a school and you went to the best place on earth and you think, why didn't I get fired earlier at all times? I'm not <laughs> suggesting I was fired. But uh, so um, I, I welcome Anuj to share this with us and I'm going to turn the program over to you. He'll be speaking later uh, tomorrow as well. So uh, here you are, Anuj. Thank you, Brian, very much. Um, I really appreciate and honored to be part of the, your organization. And, um, uh, you know, last year I gave a talk and I realized uh, what a marvelous work that you are doing for the community. You know, we all do our own work um, and we are very busy in our those own work. But for doing a community, it takes a lot of sacrifices and a lot of uh, time commitments and efforts. Um, and hats off to you. And I, I know what are the uh, challenges one face in organizing an event, something like that, or in community like this, um, because I was at Arizona State University, a faculty tenure track faculty there. And I did a program there for a number of years, which was very successful, funded by National Science Foundation and National Security Agency. Um, and I knew ins and out that how difficult and challenge it is to bring the community of researchers and doing uh, amazing flavor, uh, like the outreach efforts that you are doing. So thank you, Brian, for making me part of it. Um, I'm really privileged and honored in that. Um, so today is actually, I was thinking, I mean, I saw such a wonderful talk uh, by such an amazing group of speakers. Um, this last talk especially was uh, Glenn's talk, and I know Glenn's very well, work, his work actually quite some time. Um, you know, I, I thought of presenting something different and I discussed with Brian on that. And it's it's the reason I wanted to discuss is not because my journey is a special trajectory of professional trajectory special, uh, but I also wanted to share um, what are the challenges I faced and how, uh, what are the things that I learned so that people can see uh, or the students can see what are the good things that they can uh, take from the, some of those experience, if not all. Um, so today I will be talking about, uh, I was an applied mathematician, and now I am a research scientist at a healthcare institutions. And everywhere I'm doing similar type of work, if not exactly the same. Um, so I will, I will browse on those uh, those journey, those aspects that really made me a scientist in today's world. Um, so I'm I'm currently working for an organization called as IKEVIA, which is uh, one of the largest consulting organization in healthcare sector in the whole world. Um, and I work for a division called as real world modeling solution, uh, real world evidence solution. And here I am um, a part of a group called as health economics group. So I'll explain these things in an example as we go in the forward. I'm also uh, uh, also a distinguished fellow at the Intercollegiate Biomathematics Alliance, Illinois, uh, Illinois State University. That's what Brian was mentioning. Normal, normal is the city in Illinois. Um, so I do many activities with them. They do um, undergraduate research programs. They do, um, you know, uh, give the, uh, you know. Uh, conferences, webinar, there are multiple activities that are going through that. Um, and then I'm also part of um, uh, min uh, Ministry of Health in India, where I am helping them in a modeling decisions of uh, health devices. How do you, um, you know, uh, distribute the budgets for the, for the right kind of health devices for the country? 
Um, and this is the institute is called as Kalam Institute of Health Technology, only one in the South Asia of this type uh, that is dealing with the health uh, medical devices. And um, also with Sitsatsai Institute of Higher Learning, which is an educational institute in India. So, uh, so let me start with my, uh, it is a random walk, literally. <laughs> there has been many ups and downs in the life, but now when I see it back, the downs were actually, I am glad that it happened because that led me to take risk in my life and that led me to go in a beautiful trajectory. Now, before I go into everything, I want to tell that um, I was introduced to Brian uh, last year by Dr. Aditi Ghosh from Texas A&M College Station. Uh, no, not College Station, sorry. Um, some of the campus, in, one of the campus in Texas A&M. And, um, and that's how I know Brian and Brian was kind enough to uh, discuss with me on my work that I have been doing. So thank you, Brian, and thank you, Aditi, for that. Um, so my career starts with traditionally like uh, doing some, uh, you know, uh, like undergraduate uh, work in physics, chemistry, and maths, but then also um, uh, lucky to be part of one of the pioneer institute in India called as Indi Indian Institute of uh, Technology Kanpur. And I did a pure mathematics work there. So I was not thinking of I would be doing work in health economics at some point of time later in my life. But that was an amazing journey. Uh, Indian Institute is a pioneer institute and there was a cutting edge. So I was that is the time when I got um, different experience and I will go deep into each one of it, but let me show you the trajectory. Then I did PhD at Arizona State University, followed by certain postdocs and I'm selected journeys that I'm talking about. There are many other things behind the scenes, um, but Cleveland Clinic, which is a hospitals, I work for infectious disease department for it. Uh, then uh, Global Health Institute at uh, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, followed by faculty position at Arizona State University in a human evolution and social change department. Um, and finally, the couple of instinct in uh, industry um, at an institution called as Precision HUR, uh, amazing institution. It is, it is, it was built by uh, some of the faculty in health policies from University of Southern California and IKEVIA at present, um, which is uh, working in um, helping healthcare pharmaceutical industries uh, resolve the latest challenges. So it's a very different, uh, if you see this, this chart, you see a very different um, uh, uh, applications areas uh, from pure mathematics to applied mathematics to global health, infectious disease, to healthcare pharmaceutical right now, even in academia also. Um, so academia industry. So there's lots of differences, lots of experience that I've gained. Uh, and I'm, I feel like at the time of transitioning, it was a very risky affairs and I was not sure whether I would be successful or not. And there are lots of challenges, but uh, when I see it back now, I feel like, thank you God for making my trajectory the way it is. Um, so. Uh, so let me show you why I say all these things. Um, so this is uh, some mathematical training early on, research training uh, in my postdoctoral fellowship, academic profession uh, experience in faculty position and industry profession in the current stage. So let me talk about some first mathematical training. And Brian, if you could kindly help me um, give a 15 minutes uh, um, before my time completes. Uh, that would be really helpful. So mathematical training. Uh, so I did it at Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. I, this is a pioneer institute because, you know, the pressure I faced there was amazing. The amount of workload. Um, I mean, I was very young and, and kind of working on um, these topology problem, functional analysis, parallel computing, graph theory, very theoretical aspects. Um, and I mean, I'm talking about the coursework basically here and that kind of, and so many, so there was a professor used to come and say, oh, today is your pop-up quiz. Uh, and the, it is a cloudy day. Let's have a pop-up quiz. And it was, it was, oh my God. And, and we all, the whole class used to get zero out of 10, for example, and it was so hard. So those challenges, 
uh, I'm glad that I went through that and it has helped me uh, face a lot of pressure. I mean, we we need to uh, understand the pressure as sometimes is good for us um, in, in our early career days. Um, although that time I was feeling very uncomfortable and lots of work uh, to work with, but today I feel like that was very key aspects of my life. Um, and then uh, also in the final two semester, I got a chance to work with a um, cutting edge project, which is now become a national back, uh, backbone of uh, um, flying industry in India. Um, it was called, uh, I was working for a, a jointly with an institution and a project with a aeronautical industries. Um, and uh, we were developing, they were developing a first time fuselage um, for a helicopter. At that time, there wasn't uh, technology in India to build that thing. So they were designing that thing. And one of the big thing was to uh, to know where the vibrations are the most in the fuselage of the aircraft. So you need a differential equations of different sort behind the scenes to be, know exactly where the vibration, how the vibe, once the uh, rotor will start, the, how the vibration will propagate and which place of the body would be the most because you want to be careful where you put the certain type of uh, instruments um, so that the vibration in the body doesn't affect that thing um, more, um, much sensory warning system, for example. So, um, so I used, um, it was first time industrial projects uh, at an academic institution. I have no background in that. Um, so typically I learned how to write manuals for, for giving it to the industry, for example. I programmed in Fortron 77, then Fortron 90. Um, Fortron 77, 20 years back, uh, 30 years back was very popular basically. So, um, you know, and, uh, and kind of, it was a programming language like C and C++ at that time. And so we have this um, physics model that captures the vibration. So these were differential equation behind the scene that were capturing the vibration propagation um, in the fuselage of the aircraft. So amazing experience I had. Uh, so I got many skill set while part of that. Um, when I came for a PhD position, I got a chance to work in um, uh, mathematical biology, applied mathematics, uh, and uh, mathematical biology, I worked on uh, social problems of alcohol drinking in college community where we were emanating, I mean, I was at Arizona State University, and Arizona State University, it was a big problem of alcohol drinking at that time, and uh, so they, they wanted to know what, what aspects work. And there has been lots of control intervention, but none of them was making a huge dent on it. So we brought an idea, new idea from my dissertation. And that idea was people think, you know, bars and restaurants are responsible for drinking at that time, at least. Um, but it was not the case. Why it was not the case, uh, you know, because people who goes to the bar have have a pre-planned ideas. So, for example, they they do a lot of social events in on campus. On campus drinking are not allowed, right? But you meet with other peers uh, in food court areas, inside common areas, inside your class, and you discuss on that thing on many aspects, including having a party or having a drinking event, fraternity sorority parties, for example, sports events. So those interaction lead to a prior uh, to later uh, drinking behaviors. So we brought this idea about understanding social context uh, that would eventually lead to potential for leading to uh, heavy drinking at bars or, or restaurants, for example. So we were studying social context where the drinking is not there, but the influences are happening that is shaping up later on for drinking. So amazing project and we used to imitate the campus and the people's behaviors in a computational system. So on the left side, you see a example of a, um, of a, a map of a campus. On the right side, it is an imitation on a, on a software called as NetLogo, um, where the buildings are made, uh, the streets are made in the same way as the streets are made in the real life. 
and you were imitating how the classes are happening, how the students are moving to the social context, to the classrooms, to the different places. And there is a cycle in which the things are happening and interaction, nonlinear interaction are happening. If you think about from a differential equation, each individual has its own differential equations here, right? But uh, so this is what, but this is a massive um, system where uh, so many things, uh, so many individuals are taking their individual action on their own behalf and optimizing it for their own self. But if you take it as a whole, as a college, it, there is an emergent behavior that is coming out of a drinking pattern from it. And so that was the idea behind the scene. So we use this examples in a beautiful way. Uh, NetLogo was uh, it was very useful software for that. But now there is lots of other softwares. Even you can do your own programming language. In NetLogo, all these pictures are easy to make. Um, and people use in explaining differential equation a lot. Well, uh, then what I did was also studied, um, this is in my PhD program, uh, I also studied uh, alcohol and cigarette behaviors because we, we realized that sometimes cigarette context uh, smoking groups um, are causing the alcohol drinking also to lead that concept. So, so we wanted to bring that thing and But the problem was, where do you find the data? These models are useless. If you have, do not, if you, and if you are applying for a policy decision and you do not have sufficient data, right? So then what we do is you see on the left hand side, there is a it's, a, it's a flyer for social survey. So I asked my student, undergraduate students, to do work on carrying out social surveys. So social surveys on how often they visit to the sum of the social context sports event. Um, uh, fraternities and different variety of questions. And then who are their friends? So we use this, uh, uh, this social survey. So we don't have a background in our, I mean, I'm trained as an applied mathematic, a math, a, a mathematician. So developing a social survey was a challenging, really, really challenging at the get-go. And but we have um, fortunate enough to collaborate with a social scientist, and um, we were able to write a right question. So if you write a question for social survey, it is very hard job. You can try it in your class. I tried the first time having a social survey and tried it in my class. Everyone interpreted the same question in a very different way. So there is a very right way, or there is a uh, systematic way of writing uh, these social survey questions to get an answer that you are looking for. And social scientists are skilled in that. But we as a mathematicians were not, but we learned from them and we were able to uh, not only write a questions from the scratch, get the data, clean the data, uh, learn the statistical method, all this done by the undergraduate and graduate students. Again, the first thing what I was doing was building community of researchers, just like what Brian is doing is this community of researchers, which is not one time deal. It's an ongoing process and continuous process where you can get help from different types. And that was an amazing experience. And so we were able to parameterize it for the first time um, for using our own data. Usually we look for other data in the literatures or collaborate with someone to give us a data. Uh, but this was the first time our students who were mathematicians and well, uh, some quantitative field at least, they were collecting data for social scientists, uh, just like a social scientist, again, in, under the guidance of a social scientist. So, so the reason for bringing this project is the real problems are really complex. Just by doing mathematical equations and helping with that, are we training ourselves uh, significant enough, sufficient enough to be in cutting edge jobs in today's market? So my current work involves many things. And I felt like these were the very important key ingredients for a student's life to get an experience in. I'll talk about many other things that I've learned. Um, in my dissertation, I also had work on neglected tropical disease. I am from India originally. And... Uh, um, right now in Arizona, but originally from India. And I, I, my come, uh, particular state affected by a disease called as leishmaniasis, which is deadly disease. 
uh, and it it is very bad painful this this uh, it will causes disability also until a person dies and so there there is a reason why it is spreading neglected means it is neglected by practitioner neglected by policy makers neglected by pharmaceutical industry and why is it neglected because there is no economic returns there's why is it not economic returns because it's affecting poor communities if you are healthy your 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 environment are clean you may not have that type of in, infection around you so it is it is less and so in 2012 this neglected tropical disease term was coined by who and um, bill and melinda gates foundations and some other organizations who started this thing uh, in 2012 uh, but they you know, the progress has been going on after Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are pumping some money in that and even other pharmaceutical and non-profit organizations are funding. But when I was in a college uh, in my, I, I took my own passion. This was not really part of my dissertation, but I wanted to do something for the community that I'm from. And so I was started working on a disease called as Lishmanyasis, which is from India. But neglected disease means many of these diseases that you are seeing. This is protozoa disease, there's virus disease, there's bacterial disease, there's helmet disease. So, um, so just wanted to give you, a, and it is affecting one in six in the world right now. I mean, so it's a huge burden of the disease. And that burden is carrying forward uh, on our health insurance, for example, because health insurance take the whole population into account and the prices rising in the prices. So if we reduce the case count in one country, which is poor, that, uh, that implication come down to the whole world in some sense. Um, and I, that is what my current work is. How can you in, uh, um, capture the value of interventions in a broader sense, not in a localized sense. Uh, so for example, the vaccine help people who are taking the vaccine, but it also helps people who are not taking the vaccine. And that is called as a herd immunity, basically. So the ecological mechanism that I used in the neglected tropical disease is, is learning lots of knowledge on ecology. I was trained as an applied mathematics and, um, uh, and there was no sense of ecology. So I had to read myself on ecology of infectious diseases. And that's where I gain much of understanding about how things happen. It is not as simple as we think the disease spread. There's a host involved, there's a vector like mosquitoes, um, there is a pathogens and the host, when we say host, there's a disease, Leishmaniasis that I'm talking about. It is spread by uh, dogs, domestic dogs, but also in the humans. So if you control the, in the humans, that does not necessarily mean that you are controlling the disease because uh, there are dogs available in the, in the, as a host. So there's lots of features that goes in the modeling world that takes into account all these aspects and make the model of different, this is a differential equation behind the scenes, uh, key features of the real life system. Now, again, it is, you don't have to put all the complexity because uh, complexity is very, very high for a real system. It depends on what is your objective and what is your goal. And But uh, here I'm showing these are the key features of the disease system that needs to be understand depending on the question that you have in mind. So the priceless life skills that I have learned during my educational training was communication skills, definitely. Uh, writing, both as writing and written, uh, writing and uh, presentation. Uh, I learned on a, any topic uh, at a very high level, regardless of difficulty. Uh, it was very difficult to know ecology, reading an ecology paper when I don't understand the language of ecology or infectious disease. So I read it, that thing, uh, papers. And so that was a very critical thinking. Now, PhD, you know, the work that I did in PhD, I don't use exactly the same thing. But what the skill set I use, uh, learned there, I'm using it. And that is that that is one needs to be critical thinking we i ha, i in my phd or graduate program i learn how to get any problem in a real life how to get to the multiple options those options would have been very limited if i would have not had those experiences 
Um, of course, programming and mathematical techniques, uh, how do you conceptualize the real system? Because the real system is very complex. So which one to choose, which one not to choose? Those conceptualization. Um, completed a long-term project independently, how to work independently. If you feel challenged, where to find it, how to find it, not only go to my advisor all the time, but how do you find it? But being also a part of a, a collaborative team. Uh, and of course, handling pressure and managing them. That is very, very key. Okay. I hope I'm not boring everyone um, with this background and it is finding it interesting for everyone. So um, the second leg of my career was in the postdoctoral fellowship where I worked in a applied department. I work in infectious disease department or global health department. That changes my perspective, way of thinking. I was not only thinking about mathematics anymore. They, I was also talking to people who had other things, who had particular cells in mind, or who had drug resistance in mind, or who has uh, community level intervention in mind, and not about mathematical equations. Because you, you know, we write many equations for learning process, that is good. But to be useful to uh, that model to be useful, you need to talk to the people who are practitioners, who are doctors, who are clinicians. And that is where the experience I had, amazing experience. I struggled initially to how to effectively talk to them. But when I leaving that place, I was uh, understanding quite a bit of it. So I work on a project on uh, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. So HIV was very high um, some uh, 15 years ago at um, in South Africa, around about one quarter of prevalence uh, was in the population. So very high prevalence in that. And so this was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this project to understand this new medicine that they were trying to uh, bring to the market called as PrEP, pre exposure prophylaxis. It's like a vaccination, but it's not vaccination. It's a vaccination that means, you know, one of the problem with HIV is when the patient comes to the clinic or present for the infection, it is already too late. The window period has already gone past. The window period is very short for realizing the infection. And then when they come, the practitioner or clinician can only do management of symptoms or, uh, or pathogen, but cannot cure it. And the, the window period is very short. So prophylaxis means you take the vulnerable population, take it as a pill every day in the morning. And the hope is that if a person gets an infection in future, that medicine is already there in the body and can fight the infection immediately. That's the idea. So, but you know, you will say, oh, wow, this is a very good idea. So there's two problems to that. One problem is uh, that you have to first of all find who to give. You can't get, just give it to the whole population. You have to give it to the vulnerable population. So in South Africa, we were doing it to the sex uh, sex workers, for examples. Uh, they were taking it every day. So uh, other problem is, second problem is, the prophylaxis medicine is also the same, one of the same medicine as we give it and treatment. Now, a treatment for HIV. So if you are giving more medicine to the population, you are putting a lot of drug pressure in the population and that is causing a lot of problem. Why? Because it generates more drug resistance cases. You don't want to bring a drug resistance cases. Why? Because you have taken 60, 70 years to develop that treatment or drug and drug resistance will spoil the innovation or the treatment. So you have to be careful how much drug resistance get originated in it while the impact of prophylaxis is, uh, or the pill is, you are saving new infection to occur. Okay, so there's a benefit, and but there is a trade-off uh, uh, in form of a drug resistance. So that trade-off is what we were studying uh, using mathematical equations, but these were almost 2,300 equations. Why? because there was different type of strains of HIV, different type of drug resistance therapies. There was different, uh, as gender was there, there was uh, sexual behavior were there, there were risk level were there. All these things taken together at a population level, there were 2,300 equations of that. 
So think about the massive uh, parameters and the uncertainties coming from the parameters. So it was a massive problem, um, but um, again, uh, you know, it was suggested by clinician. As a mathematician, I will not do a model uh, with the 2300 equation because then you don't understand many things. But they have a real life data that was continuously coming in the system that helped in reducing lots of uncertainty associated with the region because they have a large project going on due to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So the model had this structure, gender, sexual activity level, uh, prep uh, or an art, uh, uh, prep is prophylaxis. That is a pill that I'm talking about. Art is the treatment. Some people were getting treatment. Some people were getting prophylaxis. Health status, infection status was there. There was uh, stage one infection, stage two infection. There are different uh, till the person gets the uh, AIDS. AIDS is a very uh, last stage of the of the disease. Um, and then HIV drug sensitive, drug uh, drugs resistance strain, and there was uh, different drugs there. So there were lots of features that was there in that. So it was a coupled HIV equation for the whole South African populations. Uh, uh, sexual active population, and we did a lot of things. So there was a results um, in that, and uh, that vax, uh, that that um, uh, prophylaxis treatment was very helpful. But but again, it was causing drug resistance. Uh, so we quantified that amount of drug resistance and amount of benefit. Next project we did, I did um, in a global health at uh, Case Western Reserve University, and I got a chance to go to Papua New Guinea because they were doing clinical trials um, on what? On lymphatic filariasis. Lymphatic filariasis is, is a disease uh, like the one you are seeing on this picture. It is called elephantitis also. Elephantitis means elephant-like legs or extremities, hands, legs. Uh, so the, the what happens is the lymphatic uh, systems here get affected and it 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 stops pumping the lymph lymphatic fluids in the body and it the lymphatic fluid get accumulated in extremities and that is causing it's a very disabling disease people cannot work people have difficulty in doing day to day life this disease is spread by mosquitoes and the on, one of the treatment there's no treatment for it first of all once you have the disease, because what it does is, is it spoils the lymphatic systems. And once you the lymphatic system is in, uh, spoiled, uh, no going back. So one way to prevent or stop this disease is by preventions. And what they do is they do mass treatment. The treatment, they spread it in the whole population and they give it on an annual basis in a maximum population. Now, not all population takes it because you can't just force the treatment on people due to superstitious belief, due to many reasons, uh, comorbidity. So you try to do mass interventions, but in Papua New Guinea, they were unable to control the disease. They, they were able to do the disease, control the disease in Middle Eastern countries very well by mass drug administration, annual mass drug administration, but they were unable to do it in Papua New Guinea. So, um, so we talked about it. It was the very starting point of the MDA uh, to achieve elimination in the Papua New Guinea. It's an island country north of Australia, by the way. One of the untouched. It's it's really beautiful. It's so natural. It's no buildings. No, it's really beautiful country. And I want to show you in the map where it is exactly. Um, so we worked on this thing using mathematical models, simple mathematical models that how much of the population needs to be given the treatment to control the to reach the elimination in Papua New Guinea. So that was the goal of it. And we worked with the Institute of Medical Research in Papua New Guinea, and it was um, first time me part of the clinical trials. So next is the academic professions. Um, you know, I moved from uh, my temporary job, which is a postdoctoral fellow to to more of a faculty position. And I was a faculty at a couple of institutions at Northeastern University in Cal uh, Illinois University in Chicago, and then at Arizona State University. In his, um, and uh, I, I was part of a mathematics uh, cohort there, faculty cohort. 
And uh, but I did number of things, and I want to talk about it. For example, we ran um, a, a social surveys. I had an experience in the past, so I worked with uh, one of the my student and a high school teacher Bashir, which is, who's on the first picture, and we we did a work on high school students. Why do they drop out from the school? And Chicago used to have very high dropout rates. So his school was in Chicago, south of Chicago uh, at that time, at least. And so we used the surveys to get the uh, data for the models. And his dissertation was on um, some of this work. And that led to a number of articles, including our work that is highlighted by BBC News, um and um and uh, you know it got a lot of press um and uh, basically you know people used to think that single parents or parental guidance could be very useful in the reducing the dropouts but it turns out uh, that parental guidance are important but until the peer influence increases beyond a certain level. So peer influence is very, very key. Um, and so we we understood the mechanism in which dropouts are happening at a high school level. So amazing project, practical project. And, you know, my research area was different, neglected tropical disease up till that point. And some social problems like alcohol drinking and cigarette smoking. But Bashir brought challenges from his own end. So I did not force my students to work on the problem of my own type. That was originated uh, from his own ideas, but I helped him shape in a way that uh, was got into such a high uh, work and, and output. Um, I, I started working also at the same time with a group uh, on uh, called as Vipra, where we were trying to understand, uh, these are the folks in my group, um, where we were trying to understand uh, aircraft infections, uh, especially the Ebola outbreak was going on at that time, uh, Zika outbreak was going on, and we were worried um, around about 10 years ago. Um, and so we wanted to see if a people travel from one, how much of uh, probability of infections lead to uh, different uh, flights and what are the characteristics? Uh, is it in the flight that is creating a problem? Is it a, is it an infection load? Uh, the way we, we board people. So we, we think particularly we were interested in boarding policies like, uh, you know, for example, the, um, American Airlines and Southwest, the boarding pass policies are very different. In Southwest, uh, who come, come first uh, goes in the Southwest, whereas American Airlines, it is the uh, it is the zone-wise boarding. So the question was, are these boarding policies generating more infection? Because in the flight, the, uh, the air circulation system is very, very good. So the chances are occurring is less. But the most of the time, the infection chances occurs when people uh, come close to it, which is a boarding policy or security lines, for example. And that is what we were looking at it particularly. And so our work also get highlighted in various press, um, uh, including in the Forbes articles and other places. But uh, um, so this was the work that we were understanding. Another work we worked on, um, this was during my faculty time, actually mass killings. And there was some mass killings that was happening at that time. This is the work published in 2015. Uh, and here our work actually got a lot of press. And here we were using infectious disease ideas to understand is there is a contagion process in the mass killings. Anytime any event happen of mass killing or school shooting, does the media attention makes next event more or less likely to occur or not? And what is the, that if there is a contagion, how many days that contagion remain? Because if you see anything like happen, every news channel uh, is showing it in a different ways. Um, so we, we use the certain models to study that thing. And it was our work, we were interviewed by in Morgan, Freeman shows uh, called as wormhole through the wormhole. Um, it was very big project at that time. Um, 
you know, all these experience that I was having in these real life projects, uh, that was, I can see the importance of those projects. I was uh, summarizing it in a course that I kind of included in this um, at Arizona State University. I have a guest speakers there from, um, from economics department, from Center for Disease Control, from different areas so that people can uh, the students can see the importance of these problems and how these people look at it, the similar problem. So there was many features in it and um, uh, it was very popular at that time when I kind of uh, implemented it in the population. Um, Brian, how, how much time do I have still? Oh, you have at least 15 minutes, go ahead. Okay, awesome. Um, so next I would, uh, now I was moving away from the academic due to multiple reasons, um, uh, family issues and health issues. Um, and I worked for industrial prof uh, professions. Initially, I was really unsure what, where will I fit? Um, but sooner or later, I realized that my skills are actually very helpful in many different uh, industrial areas. Um, although I do have to learn many things by my own uh, online, but uh, I was able to um, maneuver myself in industry smoothly. And uh, I got a chance to work with two companies, Primely and Precision HR and, and uh, Ikevia, and they are both in an area called as health economics and health policies. Now you will wonder why I'm, uh, you know, you know what, what do we do in that? I mean, health economics is, is same thing as infectious disease understanding, but then the economic layer is added on top of it. Um, so, uh, so I worked on a project such as the COVID was going on, the COVID uh, at that time. So COVID, I mean, it's still going on. So, but uh, COVID was very high in the peak, uh, it started. So we were worrying about when the influenza season comes, then what will happen, it will explode, the cases will explode. Um, and how will the health, um, the hospitals will kind of tackle those things. So we used, um, there was a rapid molecular test by a company came into more market. Now rapid molecular, the main test for COVID, if you have taken a test is COVID, uh, is um, PCR. Uh, PCR is a is a polymer chain reactions uh, test which takes few days. At least that time it was taking few days, but rapid molecular test is is uh, less accurate, but more rapid. It takes thirty minutes to identify the infection, right? So uh, so we were worried about when the influenza season will come, how many COVID cases or how much of cases will occur and what would be the cost of rapid molecular test to implementing it. It was a new test in the market, basically. So we wanted to study the value or economic value of rapid. So we have a, dis behind the scene, there was a differential equation in a disease spread for influenza and COVID. But on top of it, we were costing, okay, if a patient goes to a hospital, how much money it charge? Patient buy certain treatment, how much it cost, right? And we are adding it together to calculate economic value of it. So economic value is nothing, just a cost. And the benefit is reducing the infection or saving hospital, um, hospital uh, going to the hospital for an infected person. So how do you do the trade-off of cost and the benefit from the for doing the intervention. In this case, the intervention is rapid molecular test. So that's the trade-off we were studying uh, in, this, in this work. Beside that, we did many things because I was entering in the industry at the time when the COVID was about to start. So uh, we have different types of epidemic models and none of them were uh, able to capture the epidemic well. Um, and it's still, I mean, still we don't have tools, no matter where we, beyond 30 days, it's very difficult to capture, uh, predict infectious disease patterns uh, due to many reasons, due to pathogen evolution, due to human behaviors, um, and, and that causes multi, very difficult. And for these two things, there is not a good models, uh, pathogen evolution and, and human behavior. 
So we built different types of model for short-term prediction or short-term understanding. And you can see in this bottom line how the evolution of the modeling takes place. It was from the simple SIR model to super spreader models, to intervention or social distancing models, to mortality related models, to models uh, in the limited resources country models. So there was a transitioning happening from a very simple to more structured model or focused models for a certain question or research goal task. Well, uh, you know, Glenn did talk about it in a previous talk about epidemic model, and I don't want to go into deep, but I want to tell you one of the challenges, what I have seen in the history, I want to capture that trend. And that is uh, uh, history of, of the disease. So for example, COVID, we had some data and we, if we plot it, we see some curves from there. And we wanted to capture that curve and then go about predicting in the future. So you need to capture that curve and which is, uh, so, so what uh, as Glenn was showing in his graph was damned oscillations in a SIR model. So beyond that, I mean, I think I think that is a trend that uh, if you look in the short term, and that is what we wanted to know, how can we generate a different patterns, high peak and then low, low peak, and then high peak and the low peak, and in a very different way, can we build that structure, patterns of structure? So I just wanted to talk to you about simple ways. So simple first model in the first row, if you have S and I compartment, you will generate a logistic curve. Okay, if you have SIR model uh, without demography, then you get a peak of one outbreak. If you have mortality, birth and death, as Glenn was pointing out, there's a damned oscillation in it. So these are the patterns that you are observing based on what compartment or what is the structure that you are putting in the models. And that was one of the tasks of the modeler for the COVID at that time. Another task was, there were different interventions government were putting. The question was which intervention will work and what time, how much duration we should implement, right? For example, closing down schools or closing down businesses, right? So the to understand that thing, we were using a concept of tipping point or threshold behavior that we use in the bifurcation analysis. Okay, so tipping point, this Markham Gadwell book is a beautiful book. Beautiful book to explain it um, in, a, in a real life, there are tipping points happen all the time. So mathematically, how can you understand it? And that was the task as a modeler for us, capturing the shape and understanding the tipping point. Tipping point means you are in a bad shape right now, a lot of cases, and you want to bring it to the lower number of cases. Um, we also did many things like connecting the scales, like clinical data to epidemiological data to intervention data. These are different levels of skills that we were, how do you connect those skills? We worked on that also, for example. Um, you know, I have a few slides here and I want to uh, just stress on one thing, the future of healthcare and medicines are changing now. Um, it's now even technology companies are coming into it. There are certain things that we are focusing more uh, but as a mathematician, we can contribute a lot more in that. Um, I don't want to go deep into this because there are other, uh, very important aspects of the healthcare that are, I want to um, quickly go into this aspects and then end actually, because um, I'm kind of out of time here. Um, currently, I am working on few organizations and including, I should have incorporated here also CME ODE because I feel uh, I'm I'm really passionate to see the work that um, Brian is doing actually and his team is doing. Um, and he doesn't have to do all these things, but he's amazingly sacrificing time and energy. In it. And thank you, Brian, for making me part of it. And uh, any help in the future, I would be happy to be part of it. Some of the institutions or some of the organization that I'm part of is the Air, Air Travel Infection, Vipra on the left side. Um, I'm working at uh, CDC, one of the projects for involving epidemics in a 
in an ensemble of models that CDC is generating. I'm also part of um, uh, World Health Organization supported uh, in India health technology aspects, um, and also run something in Europe also. Uh, and, and last but not the least, at Illinois State University, there's an intercollegiate biomathematics alliance. And Brian, for you, actually, if there is anything that I could help from connecting it to that organization, I would be happy to do it in future. Um, so um, I, I was part of this program called as Mathematical Theoretical Biology Institute. It was a summer REU program, ran it for a number of years. Um, amazing program. It has changed. You see the left hand side, the picture with a cohort of one year. There was almost like 100 participants at a given time with 20 uh, to 30 faculty members, postdoctoral fellows to, uh, to different levels of uh, guidance and community building. And it was not only in the summer that community was built throughout the year. One of the important feature was something called as flipped hierarchy. What that mean was, the questions or the problems was not given by the faculty, but was given but from the choices of the students. And the reason that was, was because the students were more motivated to work with them. And we, our faculty goal was to only guide them. Now we were also as a student there in that project because these were new problems. For example, someone is impacted by cancer in the family and they wanted to work on a cancer problem. We were okay with that. But we as a faculty has to learn quite a lot in the cancer if that is not my field, for example. So I did a lot of work in that. Um, and I want to show this pictures. The mathematicians are very spectrum of type of mathematician from an analysis, pure analysis on the right side, uh, sorry, left side to right side being a very, very applied mathematician who work with the community. So right now I am towards the right, but when I started my career, I was more towards the pure aspects. And there are lots of things between the things where you could find job opportunities. So I want to uh, end it with this package deal that I'm talking to you about that I've learned is communication, of course, was a very key in my aspect, communication through community that I was part of, of networks that Brian is building also, outreach effects, uh, my research writing and, and presentation, of course, was, was not the only one though, but there were other aspects. Uh, but then also innovation that I did in the work uh, that led me to think innovations in alcohol drinking, innovation in high school dropout rates for uh, dropouts, um, and even in neglected tropical disease. And something entrepreneurship was very key, and that is a product development. You know, for us in a in academic, we don't we less understand the product meaning. In industry, it is more. And most of our students are going in an industry, by the way. Right. And so the training has to be a little bit in entrepreneurship as well. Um, and that is happens due to the community building and having me, for example, here clearly shows brand visions because I'm in industry right now, mostly. And uh, uh, and so I'll stop here, but I am very active also in social media, in in. Uh, um, in putting my ideas there. And that's what the communication I'm talking about. When you put certain things in, in the social media, you have to be careful what to put, how to put. Um, and technical things also, how easily you can put it. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Brian, very much. I may have taken a lot of more time than I'm... Uh... I'm fine. We, we thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm... I'm tempted to fall back on my New York City cynicism roots and say, well, what have you done lately? Uh, but you've shared a life's experience and uh, we're so pleased with it. Uh, it maybe makes people think if they can get their students involved in some projects or activities or take risks themselves, uh, no matter what stage in their career. Uh, maybe just working for a company in town or, or trying to do something on a, a volunteer project. Uh, obviously, you've been then drawn in deeper and deeper and deeper and uh, produced quite well. Are there other questions or issues or examples uh, that people want to ask uh, Anush about? 
Well, and and I I will be happy to uh, discuss with others through email. Message me, please do message me. And uh, you know, one thing that Brian just mentioned that uh, you know, uh, working on inspiring projects are very helpful, or out projects which are practical. You know, how you get in touch with that through the community. Through the community, you have to be actively involved in the community, like Brian is talk. Uh, Brian is working on. You have to participate in. You have to say, like I was um, this. Uh, I was in the talk um, by Anthony, or who was the first talk today in the afternoon? Uh, Anthony about Scudum. Yeah, after Scudum, I can see that that he is not only doing the research, but he is doing some outreach. Okay, he devoted some time to be part of it. So clearly. He is taking risk. He is taking. Um, he is going over and board than what is uh, done in the classroom, for example. And he will be very successful. I can see that in future. So, yeah, I would. I would never hesitate after my experiences in a first year curriculum when I was in Indiana at Rose Holman. I would never hesitate to involve students in going into the community and helping out. Uh, there are many things that students can see, and they don't threaten employees. They don't come in with a, a clipboard of time study. They're just bushy-tailed students, and um, they can offer great service. Uh, one time we went to a cable company, and they were extruding one-inch copper into a half-inch, one-inch copper to a quarter-inch, one-inch copper, and their production was going down. And the students went and they just wandered around the factory asking questions and they came back and they go, it's embarrassing. And I said, what do you mean it's embarrassing? And they said, every time they do one to a half an inch, then the next cable they pick up goes one to a quarter inch. If they just do all of the same one to a half in a row, they wouldn't have to recalibrate their machines every time. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. They don't do that. He goes, no. They, it takes a half an hour to recalibrate the machine each time they change. And every time they do a job, they change. So they gave a presentation at the, at the corporate group and they slipped one slide where they suggested that they group them all together. And the guy who was the president of the company after the presentation, he went, can you go back to slide seven? And they said, sure. And he goes, now, if we do them all the same right after each other, we can save time. That's an incredible idea, you know? And so the students, imagine how they felt when they came away saying that was real money. And that wasn't deep mathematics, but it was at least scheduling, you know? Uh, so you've obviously done that all your life yourself as a risk taker, am I right? As a young person, no doubt? Yeah, so uh, definitely the uh, until you take a risk, and especially at the young age, it is it is very fruitful to be a risk taker. Now, it was not a random risk taking. It yes. was risk taking under the guidance of um, uh, community members like Brian, like my advisor, like my collaborators, for example, after consulting with him. And, uh, and even... Even I take the risk, I was in continuously touch with it. And also I have to do my part. Risk, just taking a risk doesn't help. You know, you, I was learning from YouTube. I was learning from other sources, some of the things that I felt is very, very key or someone else told me in the community that is very key. Bev, you have a question? Uh, uh, both, uh, no, not really. I just want to say it was a wonderful overview and the stressing the meaning of community and how important that is was excellent i thank you very much thank yeah. you we're very grateful um and when you try something those of us who have you know anything from helping the girl scouts schedule the routes for how kids do things whatever it is you can help with um there's this great feeling of being part of something bigger than yourself and uh, even if it's uh, non-profit or if it's profit. Um, and I think what Anuj has shown us is that great things can happen um, and there's residuals. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to stop now. Anuj is gonna give the last talk of the conference. Um, so we've saved the best, best till the end. Thank you, Anuj, again.